y Verónica Pascuarela from the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. Uh, this is the title of her talk, and Veronica, welcome and thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you for the opportunity to give a talk here. Uh, I've loved the talks up to now, they're really great. So today I'm going to talk about uh, two-dimensional vacuum transitions and the holographic interpretation. This is an upcoming work uh, done with my supervisor, Professor Fernando Quevedo. So the outline of my talk is the following. I'll provide the motivations uh, of uh, my research, the methods of the calculation for the two-dimensional transitions in both the Euclidean and the Hamiltonian methods. And then I'll provide the holographic interpretation of all the results. So as a start the motivations in string theory landscape, most of the minima that are obtained from dimensional reduction are anti -decitters. And so for this reason, the stability of anti in four dimensions is one of the key issues to be addressed. Then um, two-dimensional two transitions and quantum gravity transitions as a, um, as a whole are promising for understanding quantum gravity in analogy with black hole physics. Because as I will show, uh, they, it shows similar unitarity issues as in information for loss paradox. Furthermore, there's the entropic understanding, which is still puzzling uh, for the uh, amplitude associated to the transition itself. And I will show that there's a possibility of going beyond detailed balance, such that it's possible to assign a specific entropy to the transition itself. And so to any kind of um, si any sign of the cosmological constant involved. So as a starter, um, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with these, but I'll just outline what are the main um, generalizations and evolutions that holography has had since its first formulations. And I will show that uh, in my findings, all these will come into play. So first of all, the anti sitter boundary conformal field theory, wedge holography, which is co-dimension two, TT bar deformations, the sitter de sitter correspondence, uh, specifying to the case of three and two dimensions, where as have been applied, for example, by uh, Silverstein et al., and the island, uh, which is, um, as you all know, is, is one of the most recent attempts that pushes holography to its most extreme formulation since it involves the entanglement of spatially disconnected regions. And today I will show that all of these features emerge when dealing with two dimensional vacuum transitions in gravity. So the methods that I will outline are three. Two are Euclidean and one is Lorentzian. So the Euclidean ones are the Coleman de Lucha and Brown Table Bomb. The former is describing the transition in between two minima of uh, um, scalar potential. Uh, and the Brown Table Bomb method instead is describing the nucleation process of a brain inside a given background. For the case of two dimensions, the space, space is just um, a U1, uh, an S1, sorry. Uh, so because of this, uh, you have particle and particle creation. Uh, and for the case, instead of the Lorentzian method, um, so in this case, we can split time and space. And um, correspondingly, at a fixed time, we can assign at a given region of space a certain cosmological constant. Then we have uh, the other side with the new vacuum, which I denote by plus and minus correspondingly. And sigma is denoting the tension of the brain that separates the two. So now I will outline the three methods and then I'll give the holographic interpretation of each one of them. Before um, starting the description uh, of the Euclidean method, I will briefly recap what is the WKB approximation, uh, which is uh, the main motivation that first led to the Coleman de Lucha um, transition amplitude. Uh, and tunneling two dimensions uh, as a whole. So starting from the Schrodinger equation in two dimensions and assuming that the wave function is a function of some functional S, um, which is basically the action, and we can expand it in terms of um, powers of uh, H-bar, uh, at zero of order, we get the Hamilton Hamilton equations. And assuming furthermore that the wave function is an eigenfunction of energy, we can determine the following relation for the zeroth order, uh, and uh, we can re we can define if for the case in which the energy is uh, smaller than the potential, the energy of the particle is smaller than the potential. Uh, we have the uh, crossing of the barrier, 
and therefore S0 is uh, imaginary, and we can define the um, decay rate gamma uh, as the exponential of minus the bounds. So the bounds is the main quantity that needs to be calculated in the Euclidean method and is defined as the difference in between the Euclidean action calculated on the instanton solution with respect to the same action calculated on the background. So this is the quantity to be evaluated in each case. For CDL, the common Lucia method, uh, the total bounds is made up of two parts, the interior and the wall, uh, and each one of them is has the same structure that I just outlined. So it's the difference of two energy, two actions. So just as, as Coleman de Lucia did in four dimensions, uh, I also did the same thing in 2D. Uh, so we have split the case without and with grounds. Without gravity, the action is given just by the, um, the scalar field part. So we have the kinetic term and the potential. And the total bounds, once being extremized with respect to the size of the bubble, uh, it's given by an expression which is reminiscent of the bounds uh, obtained by the standard calculation for the Schringer pair production, uh, just by identifying the tension of the wall with the mass of the particle and epsilon, which is the energy difference in between the cosmological constants, uh, with the energy difference uh, in between the uh, electric, the energy associated to the electric field before and after pair production. Once adding gravity, assuming um, that the O2 symmetry of the instanton is preserved, uh, this is the metric ansatz in conformal gauge, uh, and the um, starting point as an action is the, I, I started using the Almeri Puczynski action, uh, which is uh, where you can see that the main difference with respect to the 4D case is the presence of the coupling of the scalar field with respect with the Ricci scalar. Then we have the kinetic and the potential term as just as in the flat case. But the main difference now with respect to the 4D case is that we can trade the kinetic term and the Ricci scalar term uh, and such that uh, there are two different ways of calculating the same thing. So let's see the difference. So removing the kinetic term, we can just do so by reabsorbing. This is just like the Almeri Puczynski method. You can redefine the metric uh, the conformal factor uh, and uh, correspondingly also the potential. And you can define then the vacua of the transition as the regions where the kinetic, the, um, the scalar field is uh, constant and constant, consequently uh, the corresponding cosmological constant for that vacuum is defined as the um, derivative of the new potential, the rescaled potential in zero. The wall instead is the region where phi changes. Furthermore, so these two um, definitions follow, uh, if you just look at the equations of motion that you can determine uh, from this action. But on top of this, there's an additional constraint, uh, which comes from um, requiring that the diagonal term, the diagonal components of the energy momentum tensor vanish. And this constraint is key in this case because it enables to determine um, a change of variables uh, unique, uniquely in between little r, which is the rate of coordinates, and phi. And in this way, we can determine the uh, wall bounds without using any thin wall approximation. And this is the reason why, in this case, I can outline two different solutions, both the thin wall, which would be the analogy in analogy with the original common Lucia derivation, and Another one, which is instead the thick wall, in the sense that it's in contrast to the method of the thin wall approximation, I'm not using any approximation to determine the first expression. So uh, then we'll see in the holographic interpretation that this is actually different. Um, the other method, instead of calculating still in the setup of Common de Lucia, is by removing um, the Ricci scalar. As I said, the Ricci scalar term and the kinetic term can be traded. Uh, just by reabsorbing, uh, uh, rescaling re re the metric and uh, the potential correspondingly. So by removing R, interestingly, we can determine the same action that Brown and Tatebaum had in their paper for two dimensions um, for the gravity part. The gravity action in Brown and Bomb is exactly like the Almeida Puczynski once R is removed, plus add in this boundary term. And this boundary term is important because this is added by hand in the round table one method to ensure that uh, the mass at asymptotic infinity takes into account that 
the renucleation process is actually taking place. And this is a key feature in presence of gravity. In absence of gravity, instead, this is absent. And so this is another main point to bear in mind uh, later. Um, and this is the main result that uh, I get for the case for this setup. Uh, and this is in agreement with the brown tomato bomb result. So basically, we have the term on the right, which is this one proportional to m and z bar. This is the same in spirit as you would get from the shrink of hair production in flat background without gravity. And this new term, the log term, this comes from the, precisely from the addition of this boundary term that I said. Um, and there, this comes from the addition of two terms, one for the background, one for the instanton. And uh, correspondingly, this is, is providing the, the additional contribution due to the presence of gravity. Um, so the key, the key take homes of this calculation is that in two dimensions, the actions for the Almey Kuczynski setup, which would be the adaptation for the CDL method, and ground table bomb agree up to a boundary term. And this boundary term is the constraint, the third constraint that I mentioned uh, earlier in the case of the Amelia Kuczynski setup. Uh, and furthermore, when we try to um, build a correspondence in between the two results, um, we notice that the cosmological constant in Amelia Kuczynski is differently defined with respect to that of ground table bomb. And this can be traded back to the fact that the setups are different. In fact, remember, common is just the scalar potential. In the case of brown table bomb, there are two components, there's gravity and there's an electric field. Indeed, in two dimensions, membrane is particle into particle production and there's no magnetic field. So the, um, effectively, the cosmological constant is given by a gravitational sector, this little lambda, and the contribution from the electric field. Um, now I'll turn to the third method, which is the Hamiltonian one of the Fischler, Morgan, and Kuczynski of the early 1990s. Uh, and this is the new method um, before we turn to the description of the holographic uh, interpretation of these results. So first of all, notice that this is a Lorentzian method uh, and I'm using uh, for two dimensional gravity, uh, JT gravity, uh, adapting it in the following manner. Uh, I'm adding, um, so we have the, the, standard, the Lagrangian density is made up of uh, the Ricci part, the Ricci scalar coupled to the Dalton phi. Then we have the cosmological constants on the two, on the two sides of the wall, uh, which is denoted by this delta function and this sigma, which is the tension. And then we have the topological part, which is the topological term, which is the phi zero r, and the two blue terms that I denoted, these are added by hand. And as you will see, these are key. These are on top of the JT gravity action. Uh, because they are constant terms that, as we will see, they will uh, play an important role. So the Hamiltonian formulation is, uh, requires that we identify the degrees of freedom and the corresponding conjugate momentum. So um, in this case, we have uh, L and phi. L is, um, um, is part of the metric, basically. And phi is, the, as I said, is the diatom. And then we have HT and HZ, which are instead the Hamiltonian and momentum constraints. So they are imposed by hand uh, inside this, uh, this procedure. So they already, they're, we're assuming that they're already satisfied. Uh, so uh, by, um, from the momentum constraint, we get a relation in between the conjugate momentum. Uh, and for the case where the lapse is one and the shift is zero, and assuming that the tension of the wall is proportional to the dilaton, if we integrate over the Hamiltonian momentum constraints at the wall, we determine the, um, the junction conditions, which are given by the system of equations, by squaring twice the junction conditions. Uh, we get this boxed, uh, this boxed equation, which is basically an energy conservation equation. If you think of the first term as being the kinetic term, and then the second one as being the effective potential, and the third one as being the total energy of the system. So for the case in which the constant term, the blue term that I had in the Lagrangian density is zero, so B, that, that was called B, if that term is zero uh, and we set the kinetic term to be uh, zero as well, uh, we can plot the effective potential uh, with this red line. Uh, and by taking the energy to be equal to minus one, uh, we can look at this blue line, which is the uh, trajectory of the particle. 
and as it hits the, the potential barrier, uh, we determine the uh, turning point. So for the case in which B is zero, there's just one turning point. As B is different from zero instead, there's this new turning point that opens up. So this is exactly the same thing that you would expect in presence of a black hole, of an non-external black hole. And you can see this by calculating the solutions to the equations of motion. And this B is actually playing the role of this additional um, root of the metric function uh, that is added on top of the one that you would expect um, coming from just from the horizon uh, of the space time if there is one. So the main results are for the case of anti de sitter to anti de sitter. Uh, in this case, the, the procedure tells us that only the brain term contributes. And so this is just the sum of two logarithmic terms. In case of de sitter to de sitter, we get the same terms plus two contributions from the horizons, the Hubble horizons on both sides. And as we take the flat limits, in this case, this diverges. So this is a problem. It means that if we try to get like the sitter to Minkowski, this is forbidden, contrary to the 4D case, which is one of the uh, common literature formulations. On the other hand, if we add B, this allows to have more exotic setups, such as Minkowski to anti de sitter, which uh, as I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with, uh, there's a famous paper by um, Valdez Sena uh, of the 2010, um, by, uh, which um, claims that you can uh, um, nucleate ADS from Minkowski. And this is not uh, in contradiction with holography because uh, you can nucleate just the subregion of ADS. And this is exactly what it, this is telling us. Um, and this is ensured by the fact that uh, the dieton remains finite while we take the flap limit on one of the two sides. Now, um, the brown table bomb action is basically uh, one kind of einstein maxwell dyson gravity, uh, in particular a type two, which, in which there's the, the coupling of the dyson to both the Ricci scalar and the gauge field. Because as I said, the total effective cosmological constant is given by the contribution of both gravity and electric field sector. On the other hand, if we had a type one, the coupling would have been just with the Ricci scalar, not with the gauge field. Interestingly, this was already noticed in, 20, in 2008 by, uh, by many, many people like Hartmann, Stromger, um, Ali Shaiya et al, that both actions admit an ADS solution which has a CFT1 dual, but just the, second, just the second one comes from a dimensional reduction of an ADS3 CFT2 setup, where the central charge is given by the usual ground final formula. So this shows, this opens a possibility uh, that uh, probably we could have an, an entropic interpretation of the uh, balance action per term without relying upon any detailed balance, which would require instead even the reverse process to be defined. And let's see if also an island interpretation can be given to this. So from the, uh, for the point of, from the point of view of uh, Common de Lucha, uh, this is in the thick wall approximation. I managed to rewrite this little action as a product of a central charge in two dimensions times a constant which I identify with a black hole mass. And the total result can be written also as a square of um, a Cardi uh, entropy for the case of an external black hole solution. So this shows that in the newly nucleated space time is a black hole in the background. So uh, the total bounce is like a relative entropy and the space times are extramal and the RG flow is like, um, and the RG flow is the CFT in two dimensions um, with this particular associated uh, holographic central charge. And the fact that the total bounce diverges when you take the flat limit is in agreement with the C theorem. Uh, and when you take the values of the two um, diatoms to be equal, the, uh, the bounce vanishes. Uh, and this tells us that, uh, so also the entropy vanishes. And this means that all the information is encoded in the CFT2 that is in between the two. So the picture is basically this. Uh, you would have the CFT2, which is the brain, the, the, the realization of the brain, which is this RG flow that's interpolated in between the two minima, which is the CFT2. And then you have the two uh, space times uh, that are undergoing the transition, that are ADS2s living on these end of the world brains. And each one of them has an opening angle, this theta one. And the same can be, so, this, in this case, this is an example of an ADS2 CFT1 that can be embedded in ADS3 CFT2, just as in brown table bomb. Um, and 
for the case of um, the Lorenzo method, instead, the, this calculation for antidecidus to antidecidus shows that the total action is a difference of two TT by deformed um, entanglement entropies. Uh, and um, this, these parameterizations show that they are consistent with the same results obtained by Berlinde, uh, et al., and Silverstein et al. for the case of uh, antidecita and decita alike. Furthermore, interestingly, uh, this shows that the, the results, our results, are equivalent to the ones obtained by Van Ramstung uh, et al. in a, the um, Halloween paper. Uh, where they show that if you take a conformal field theory in two dimensions and you replace it, a portion of it, with another CFT2, and you take uh, one, um, the ground state uh, of that new CFT2 and um, you try to um, bulk reconstruct uh, from that inside the original background, you try and see how much you can build, bulk reconstruct. For the case in which you have, you take the ground state of the new CFT and you try to approximate the ground state of the old CFT, uh, they obtained this configuration, which means that basically you can both reconstruct everything and it goes deep inside the IR. And this is exactly what we get for the case of anti decisive to anti decisive transitions in absence of non-external black holes. So correspondingly, from the holographic point of view, this means that you can have wedge holography, which is realized. And so the entropy, the total action is actually the entropy calculated on the defect of the wedge. And uh, the um, corresponding Ryutaganaki surface just goes inside the bulk and reaches the um, event horizon of the thermal fuel double. On the other hand, uh, for the case where you turn on the mass parameter of a non external black hole, this is equivalent to the Van Ramstonk result where you have an excited state that it tries to mimic the ground state of the old CFT. And so this shows that beyond a certain threshold of the mass of the black hole, uh, there's a change, a phase transition in between the Ryutaganaki surfaces from the hartmann mandel uh to the island one. Uh, and this, is, this island emergence is shown from the fact that the um, value of the diatom at the horizon actually turns to constant once you go beyond a certain value of B. Uh, and this is actually what I showed in this plot, uh, showing that the brain action is the sum of terms the first term would be like the entanglement entropy in between two intervals in absence of the B term that determines this, uh, um, this um, deformation uh, of the action. And then I have two additional terms, leading order terms in B. And these terms are like S and T channels. When you calculate the entanglement entropy on two, over, for, over, two, TT, over two intervals, uh, you have to look at all the possible ways of um, um, Closing in between the um, the, um, the extremes uh, of the interval, so you can either close on the same interval or uh, cross in between the two. So this this is what I mean by SNT channels. Uh, so you can actually see that this phase transition takes place beyond a certain value of B. So before it's just monotonic, and then it it picks up a minimum value. Um, so the main results are these uh, that um, holographically. Um, it is possible to see that the three formalisms agree in most of the cases, in particular in the case where there's no external black hole involved. Sorry, in the case where there is uh, an external black hole involved, uh, then the flat limit of two dimensional vacuum transitions requires a black hole to be involved. Black holes play a similar role as CT bar deformations in a CFT2. And because the black hole mass is related to the UV cutoff of a conformal field theory, uh, and the behavior of the total action is can always can always be recasted to the difference of two generalized entropies in the spirit of uh, Maldacena et al. In the when formulating the island uh, proposal for solving the information loss paradox, and as future directions and work in progress, uh, I'm currently working on the relation of my findings to non-invertible symmetries. Uh, and with this, I'm done. And um, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks very much, Veronica. Very nice talk. Um, 